So in terms of building an ink wash drawing, we're going to start out with our puree. I have my, my quill, my drawing quill. We'll start out with like a regular pen and ink drawing. Looking for line weight, trying to get thick and thin. I'm thinking about Guercino using those cross contour lines and marks. Dealing with the tree trunk, we're going to just do a simple little broken split branch here. Maybe we'll put a little hole like a little elf lives in here. We can do some grasses that it's forming on, maybe let the roots come down. You know, you're going to look at nature ultimately and nature will tell you what to do. Get a little hillside going back. I need to dip again because I'm running low. We talked a lot about the importance of complexity with a drawing. Now, when you're drawing, you're going to look at the landscape, and the key is that you're going to squint your eyes. And you're going to squint your eyes until you start seeing the pattern of shadow that's forming on the object. But it's not a mystery here. I want to talk to you all about shadow. And to do that, the best thing for me to do is to actually think about this tree for a minute, OK? And what's the most abstract, simple form that resembles that tree? We would say the most simple form for that tree would be a cylinder, right? In other words, the tree is basically a, a big cylinder that is wrapping around. And so when we have a cylinder in front of us, we're going to have a situation where if light hits this cylinder, the rules of light tell us that only part of that cylinder can be illuminated by light at a time, and otherwise the rest of it has to be in shadow. So I'm going to draw a few cylinders here of different sizes, and we're going to talk a little bit about the rules of light and shadow and how that forms and what would happen. Keep in mind, what does the drawing look like now? It looks like a pen and ink drawing, but the ink wash is going to do something kind of wonderful to it once we switch gears and mix up some ink wash. But let's talk a little bit about light and shadow on cylinders or on any object for that matter, what we call forms and light. So here's the rules of light, okay? Light moves in a single direction until it hits something and then it changes direction. So for instance, if light was coming in directly from the side of this object here, the cylinder, we would know that half of the object would be lit and half of it would be shadow because the way light works, only half of a form can be light and only the other half can be shadow. What we want to do is imagine that we can see through the object, okay? That we have x-ray vision and we want to think about where our light is coming from because a wonderful thing happens here, okay? If we can follow the line of direction of light into the middle of the object, the line that is perpendicular to that is going to hit the outside of the object and it's going to tell us exactly where the break of shadow will be on the object so that we then can start to discover what part of the object is the shadow side and what part of the object is the light side. And so I'll go in with some cross hatching here. And what I'll do is I'll start to construct what we call the break of shadow. Now, in order to see this, you're going to squint your eyes at your objects that you're drawing. So I'm going to put my hand in the camera. OK, 
okay? And I'm gonna turn it, all right? And I'm gonna bring my light source down and I'm gonna put my finger out, okay? And my light source is now coming from over here where my other finger is. You can see my shadow cast onto my finger, okay? And you can see the break of shadow running right along the middle of my finger area. And that break of shadow is sweeping with the contour of my finger, okay? Now, if I put the light source in a different position and I bring it up on top of my finger, so I'm slowly moving the light source I'm moving the light source from back behind my finger. I'm gonna, re I'm gonna raise it up over my finger like the sun is rising. I want you to watch what happens. Notice how my cast shadow is moving. Now you can even see my lamp up there in the camera. Okay, where did the break of shadow go? It's moving to the left, in other words, as my light source moves, the shadow moves as well, okay? These are the rules of light and shadow. And it all is based on the geometry of understanding the direction that the light is coming in versus the direction that the shadow is moving. So in the case that light's coming in directly from the side of an object, the shadow break will happen in a certain position. And what we say is this, the shadow will be 90 degrees of an angle from the angle of lighting. And so this angle right down here that I'm pointing to would be a 90 degree angle. I'm gonna move the light from the side and I'm gonna move it toward the front of the object. What's gonna happen? Well, just like with my finger, if the break of the shadow used to be here, when the light was at the side and I move my light this direction towards the front of the object, the break of the shadow will move over with the movement of the light, okay? And so I'll have a different proportion. Notice how on this one, half of my object is shadow and the other half is light. Well, now I have a situation with my light coming in at a frontal angle where only a sliver of the object is shadow and the vast majority of the object is light. Now, if I keep moving, the light will change and what will keep happening. Eventually, I'll move to where my lighting is coming in from the front. If the light is from the front, where is the shadow? Be on the edges of the object, and in fact, where it would really be is behind the object where we don't even see it. But we might see a little remnant of shadow along the edge, just a little tickle of it, but not very much because the shadow would actually be all behind the object. We really can't see it. So what about if we keep rotating the light? So now I have side lighting, I have front, okay? I'm gonna put the light in from a perfect 45 degree angle. Where's the break of shadow gonna be? It would be on the right side now because the light is from the left. And if my light is put halfway from side to front, all right, I want you to imagine that these two angles are the same. So this lighting is coming in exactly at the halfway point. Where would that go? If the light is halfway between front and side, then the shadow is halfway between the center of the object and the contour, exactly half. Remember I said you want to imagine that you can see through the object? Okay, so if I can see through the object, my angle of light is coming in like this to the center, and my shadow is going from here through center across the object, and it's coming up on the other side, and it's doing this. And so this half 
would be what we call the shadow half of the object, and the other half is the light half. This is 90 degrees, right, halfway around the object. The front is zero degrees. That's where the artist is, right? My lighting, if my lighting is at 45 degrees, 45 degrees is half of 90, so the shadow has to be half of half. Therefore, the shadow is one quarter of the object and the light space is three quarters of the object. And we can mess with that geometry all we want by nudging the light further forward or further back, okay? Now, let's do one more cylinder. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our light and we're gonna move it, we're gonna move it from here, we're gonna move it all the way around the object so that it's coming in from behind the object, but not quite at a perfect straight angle. It's not coming in from straight behind the object. It's not coming in from the side. It's coming in from an in angle the there. Where is the shadow gonna be? There's zero degrees, this is 180. This is 90. And so this would be 90 plus 45. This would be 135 degrees around, right? So where is the shadow? The shadow would be halfway between where the light could hit and where the shadow would end up being. So all of this back here would be shadow. This is kind of backlighting in a way or kind of off backlighting, right? So here's the cool thing, ready? They all have names. If it's from the exact side, we call that side lighting. If the light is positioned not from the very front and not from the side, but in this zone or in this zone, we call that form lighting. This would be front lighting. Because it's coming directly in front of the object and it's actually coming from the artist. This one is what we call rim lighting. And rim lighting gets the name because the light is going to form on rims of the object. So what I'm going to do here in my drawing of the tree is I'm going to put the sun setting kind of low in the sky. The sun's going to be back here. Do a nice little happy sun. What position is that sun in, in relation okay. to me? So here's the bottom line, is that we would have rim lighting on my tree. Don't forget, if I'm sitting there, I'm also gonna so look at it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna transform this drawing from its state now, pen and ink, and we're gonna use some ink Step wash. One, we're gonna take a cup, and we're gonna fill it with a little bit of water, okay? You don't need a lot. You can see I just have about an eighth of an inch. And you don't need a fancy palette, but if you have a nice fancy artist's palette, you can go ahead and use that, okay? What we're then gonna do is we're gonna take some ink out of the bottle. We're gonna drop in a couple of drops of ink into the water. I'm gonna do four drops, okay? And I'll close this back up. Now, there's no rocket science to this, okay? I did four drops. I have no idea what that's gonna look like until I stir it up. Because, look it, I'm not gonna get out my teaspoons and measure how much water is there. I, I'm gonna do this by feel, so I may need a few extra drops. But let's go down here to our area on the side. I'll go actually to the far left, and I'm gonna test it. Okay, now I guess I got lucky because I'm pretty happy with that right there. But if it's too dark, and let's suppose you go and do this, and when you brush it out, it looks like this. That's too dark, right? It's gonna make all your light disappear. If, in, if on the other hand, you mix your water and your ink, and when you test it, it looks like this. It's too light, I can't see a darn thing. Okay, there's really no effect. It's not gonna do anything for me. So what you wanna do is mix it until it feels like it's kind of a middle value. And again, I'm gonna take this and test it off to the side. And I think we've got something pretty good right there. I got lucky. 
sometimes you get lucky, I guess. So we said rim lighting, let's go through. Rim lighting means that the right side of the tree would be lit, but most of the left would be shadow. So let's put a little ink wash down here like this. The cast shadow would come towards us. So let's make that cast shadow lay down. This branch up here would be blocking a lot of the light. This one would have a little more on it and we'd have a little light in the nook of the tree. And we'd get these little shadows to happen like this. And you can see the ink wash kind of dabbles its way along the page, okay? Now, ultimately, what else do we want to do? We want to probably give some of the foreground some ink wash. So I could take some of this and I could mix a little bit of water into it to make it lighter. And I could come over here and I could lay an ink wash over the whole area of land behind the sun to make it look a little bit more like That area of land was behind the sun, the sun was behind it, casting its shadow. I might bring some of that as well. Maybe I'll bring some streaks of sunlight. Again, you're gonna look at nature and it's gonna tell you where to add that ink wash. I can even go into the sky and maybe the sky had some setting clouds of sunset. I saw this the other day happening in the sky and we can add a little ink wash like that. Ultimately, I'm trying to keep it simple for you to show you it is simple. And if I stop there and I want the tree to be a little darker than everything else, what I simply can do is dip into my same exact ink wash and just double up the tree, but not anything else. And you can see the tree immediately gets darker than what's around it because I doubled the layer of ink. And so using doubling up is going to let you create more depth of values in your drawing. I might even want to go and do a little dabbling of texture in the grass and ultimately enhance the drawing to my own liking. The ink wash will reach a saturation point and so that after about the fourth layer, and I, this is a, I say about because sometimes you can get five layers out of this, but after around the fourth layer, it doesn't matter what you do in doubling up, it doesn't get darker. And if you want it to be darker, but also be done with a wash technique, that is when you're gonna take your ink bottle, okay? And you're gonna go and drip a couple more drips into your mixture so that you saturate the mixture more and it's gonna make for a darker tonality that's gonna give you a little bit of a darker push. So for instance, if I wanted to go a little darker on this edge and maybe in the core of the shadow space, so you can see we can make that pop by just pushing my amount of ink in the water. 